Dear students, good morning. This is the class for Comparate, secondo anno, uh, and it is the class for April the 6th, 2020. Uh, so you tried that test on Wednesday, and some of you uh, sent me some emails, so I want to reply through the video um, to that, even if I, I've already um, answered the email. Uh, and more specifically, you asked me about this. Mm, give me a second, let me get to it. Okay, um, one question was about... Uh, where is it? One question was about question number three when I said, in the utterance, he came home last night, late last night, came as an example of, I just said place de exist, but actually um, it's better to say place and time de exist because came refers to a past, but there has to be a term of comparison and uh, also place. Then Another one that was totally wrong, uh, positive face number seven, is not only the image that every society member wants to claim for him or herself, which is more the equivalent, uh, the answer for uh, face in general, it's better to say, and it is correct, the answer that is correct is letter A, the need to be understood, liked, and approved by others. So thank you very much for um, telling me, uh, writing me a message about that. And so uh, last Wednesday, we looked at the answers for this test and we went a little forward into section B of your book. Um, either if you have the book or if you don't, uh, I'm, I just ask you to do the parts that, I'm, um, that we're doing together in the slides. Okay. Uh, so again, you don't need the book if you haven't bought it. It's fine. Perfectly fine. Um, so, uh, we got into the development part of your text, and uh, we, um, we looked at this first case. This, this section of the book basically gives you some cases, some samples on how to analyze texts, uh, how to do discourse analysis. And so, we looked at this first conversation, how things are going, um, that was in a school environment, a university environment. And there were people talking about their courses. Um, and we saw how to analyze this text from a situational perspective, um, the, the perspective of situational context, cultural context, and then interpersonal context. As for B2.1, we analyzed a text, um, a, an excerpt from Between the Acts by Virginia Woolf. And we analyzed this text. I showed you how to analyze this text. For, uh, from a co-text perspective. Um, so we looked more specifically at grammatical cohesion, endophoric and exophoric reference within this text, um, and also techniques of ellipsis and substitution. Um, then we looked at lexical cohesion. Okay, What are the lexical techniques that Virginia Woolf uses to create a cohesive text? We looked at some cases of repetition, superordinates, and then um, that was it. Um, as for the videos that we watched, we watched a video about what does your language style say about you. And if you haven't watched it, just I gave you the, um, the links in the description box. Now, let's look at the analysis of B3.1. This section is going to show us how to deal with speech acts, how to analyze speech acts that are involved in a text. And uh, the text that the book offers you is Fox Hunting Undercover. This is from a BBC thriller um, series where there is an old detective called, named Dalziel. And in this excerpt, we're going to see that Dalziel's boss asks him um, about a female police officer. 
this police officer was enrolled, was engaged by, was um, uh, hired by Daniel, uh, Daltiel, sorry, to work undercover. She was asked to be a horse rider because there was something that Daltiel had to discover in the hunting world. Because um, there was one of the fox, fox hunters that had been killed, had been murdered, and so Daltiel um, hired this woman to go undercover and find out who killed the fox hunter. So we're going to look at the relationship between Dalziel and his boss and how that is done through speech acts. Okay. Before we get into the text, I wanted to put here something that wasn't in uh, in your book that uh, they mention later on, but I think that you need this to um, realize, to understand what is going on with the analysis of speech acts here. We'll go back to this in the semantics part, but this is what you need for now. When we produce an utterance, so when we say something, we can perform three types of acts that, according to Austin, the scholar that we're going to hear about a lot during this course, we can perform three acts. Locutionary act, illocutionary act, that is also known as an illocutionary force, and a perlocutionary act, that is also known as a perlocutionary effect. What does this mean? Locutionary act is the act of saying something. Um, here you have an utterance that produces literal meaning. So it's the mere act of saying something. For instance, it's hot in here. I just say the words, it is hot in here. That's a locutionary act. I'm saying something. Second step or second act that I'm performing. I can perform an illocutionary act, or better, it's better to say illocutionary force. It makes you understand more. This means, this is defined as an utterance which has a social function in mind. What does this mean? This means that the person that says it is hot in here, does not say, does not say these words just for the sake of saying it's hot in here as a statement. What do they want? They want somebody to get up and open a window, right? Open a window or turn the air conditioning on, whatever. This is called an illocutionary force. It is the social function that is behind a locutionary act, behind the act of saying something. Last aspect, last act, that is related to this, is called perlocutionary act, or better, perlocutionary effect. And that is an utterance that gives an effect to, doing, to do something. What does this mean? This means that probably there's somebody in the room who is going to stand up and open the window for me. It is the effect that my words have on a hearer. Okay? So let me review that for you. I gave you the example, it's hot in here. If I want to analyze this as a locutionary act, it is just the statement of saying that the speaker feels hot wherever he or she is. Illocutionary act. 
elocutionary act or force is the social meaning that is behind this utterance, behind the elocutionary act. In the case, in the example of it's hot in here, this can mean two things from a social point of view, depending on the context. It could either mean that I want somebody to open a window. It's hot in here, so I want you to open the window for me. Or it can be the refusal to close the window because somebody is cold. Okay? So let's say that there are 10 people in a room and there's one who is cold. You don't want to close the window for that person. And then perlocutionary act or perlocutionary effect is that somebody will stand up and either open or close the window, depending on the context. Okay, it's easier for you to remember this, um, to, to focus on this, um, this act, this utterance, um, if it's explained, if it's said during the summertime, okay? It's easier for you to remember, to understand what I mean. With that said, I'm going to read the dialogue first. So there's the boss and Dalzio. Undercover, this isn't your private army. Is she okay? She's good. In fact, she spent half her childhood on a horse. How do I know you're lying to me, Andy? Look, we've even give, given her a full story. Set up a liaison point. Visitors often go on a ride with another hunt. They come for a few days, stay at a local pub, borrow a horse. And since hunting is drinking as much as, and since hunting is about drinking as much as it is, it is, it is riding, sorry, it should be long, it shouldn't be long before someone becomes indiscreet. All right, but don't upset the locals. Hunzen is a nice village. Pity it's not a bunch of miners. Then we could have done what we liked. We'll go back to what this means later. Watch it, Superintendent. I'm not asking you to kowtow to the gentry. I'm telling you to go by the book. You see, I know how you work. Okay. Take a minute to read this on your own, okay? Silently. It will make more sense. Sorry. Wait, it's just a second. Sorry for that. Let's go.
Okay, let's look at what happens from uh, a speech act point of view. First thing that we have to consider it is is that it's a transaction. Okay, it's not just a chat, just to talk about something. It is a transaction that has a purpose, and that influences the way speech act uh, the speech acts are used. The boss wants a perlocutionary effect. She wants a reaction from Daltier. For instance, when she says, how do I know you're not lying to me, Andy? What she wants from Daltier, Daltier is some reassurance. She wants to make sure that Andy, that Daltier, is not lying to her. She wants to be sure that he that she can trust him. That he wants to that he can reassure her. How many times do we just ask things? Not because we really not because we really want to ask that question, but just because we want to be reassured about something. We want somebody to give us the strength or the answers that we don't have for ourselves. Or let's look at a case of illocutionary act that is included in this text. And it is when she says, I'm telling you to go by the book. What is this person saying with these words? She is performing a social role, right? She's doing something that goes beyond the literal, the literal meaning of these words. She is warning him to respect the rules, the rules of um, detective, detective rules, or whatever rules they are. She wants him to respect their code and not do anything strange. Or another case of an illocutionary force is when she said at the beginning, this isn't your private army. So what is the social role of this sentence? She wants to forbid him. She wants to avoid that Daldil could use these people for his own purposes, with his own ends. Okay, so she is saying, watch out, you should not use these people for your own aims. Let's go back to that, how do I know you're not lying? Uh, I think there's a not that should be here. Sorry. How do I know you're not lying? We said that this has the perlocutionary effect of being reassured. But at the same time, it also has an illocutionary force. It's also an illocutionary act because this woman is giving an indirect command to Daltio. He, she is trying to forbid him to lie to her. In some parts of the text, she uses indirect speech. And we, we've learned what this means. When we talked about being off record, on record, bold or indirect. In other cases, she wants to make sure that Daldil understands 
what she is saying by using direct acts. And she does this in several parts of the text. So when she says, don't upset the locals. Or I'm telling you, go by the book. In these two cases, she's direct. She's using direct language. Now let's look at what Dalzil replies, what Dalzil says. At the beginning of the text, she sa he says something like, in fact, she spent half her childhood on a horse. What does this mean? It is a direct representative act in the, in, the, in the sense that it is giving information about this woman, this woman that is undercover for him telling us that this person is very experienced. At the same time, this is also an indirect expressive act. Uh, we'll look at all these expressive representatives um, later on too with the second book, but it's quite um, self-intuitive. This person is praising the woman. Okay, So it's not only giving us the information that a piece of information according to which this person has spent all their life on a horse, it's also praising this person, saying that she is experienced. And he reinforces this with a direct reassurance saying, don't worry, everything is in order. Okay, that don't worry that he adds in lines four to six tries to reassure uh, his boss of that saying that everything is basically okay. Lines 10 through 11 give us some cultural background that is not included in the text. When uh, Dalzil says, pity it's not a bunch of minors. It's referring to uh, Thatcher and when she destroyed mines. What he wants to say here is that they have to use a double standard in the investigations and try not to offend the aristocracy. Okay? And she gets it because then she replies, watch it out, superintendent. Okay? Don't go against the gentry. I'm telling you to go by the book. Use a double standard. Okay. So now let's move on to B4.1. As you can see, I'm skipping some texts. And uh, this one is about pragmatics of conversation. Uh, the title of the text is Scrabble. And it's basically a dialogue, some chit chat between a mom and a daughter who are playing Scrabble together. So I'll read the text first and then we'll look at some parts of it. I don't know what you're doing on that. Oh, no, no. No fear, I should say. Okay, see that there's some overlapping here because then the mother starts saying, well, do it somewhere else. I mean, look, there's plenty of other places to put it. How about here? I like it like that. Okay. Um, it's okay. Oh, God, you don't. First of all, you don't score so much. 
And secondly, you only get rid of two letters and you make your chances of picking up anything better. Okay, you see that there's some overlapping here. Mm -hmm. That much more reduced by not, you know, getting rid of as many as, many as overlapping, you can. 2, 4, 6, 7, 24 is 11. I mean, you could do so much better than that if you'd only, and then the mother says, yeah, I'm busy, I'm busy eating as a matter of fact. Oh, I didn't really like that sandwich. And the daughter laughs. I wouldn't have noticed it. And she laughs again. You've packed away most of it all the same. Okay, and then there's the mother saying, no, but I, no, but I kept hoping it would get better and it got worse. And they laugh, salty, don't like salty things. Okay. Take a minute to read this part silently too, and then we'll move on to part two of the dialogue. Okay, as you can see, it doesn't make... The first thing that you should notice is that without the context, we can understand very little from it. Have some banana bread. Look, I'm not much of a banana bread eater, and I wish you'd stop bothering. And the mother says, oh, I forgot. Never mention it again. Yes, I mean, you know, I know where these things are. If I'm that interested, I'll ask. If I may have another piece, if I may have a piece, and then you can tell me. You haven't made, an, you haven't made any for months. Or don't make it anymore. And she laughs. I've got a whole load of my own banana bread in the fridge. I don't know. Do we have Sana? S-A-N-A. -A? No. We have Sauna. S-A-U-N-A. -A. Right here we have, and then she says something unclear, a funny game. That's a funny game. Go and ox. And the ox is um, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Mm. You're now 80 behind. If you'd listen to me, and she laughs again, you'd only be 70 behind. Anyway, what else did Linda have to say for herself? Okay, let me... I'll just give you some time to read through that part. Okay, so anyway, what else did Linda have to say for herself? Oh, a lot. Never left off. When she's finished with the kids, she goes back to Felicity and all her achievements. 
actually, you probably wouldn't have enjoyed it here. Okay, with um, the daughter saying, oh, and laughing. What, what do you mean about Felicity and her achievements, is it? Oh no, I've been inured to that for years. How wonderful she is, you know, how she talks. And so, and then it continues, but that's fair enough for this thing, for this dialogue. Okay. So what can we understand, what can we see from this section? Sorry, let me move it downwards, otherwise we can't see it all. So let's look at the social context and the context in general. So it's part of a dialogue between a mom and a daughter, or actually some chit chat more than an actual dialogue. And the first thing that you've noticed also visually is that there are lots of interruptions and overlaps in turn, in turn taking. Okay. Remember that when uh, we're talking about interruptions, okay, there's a here that starts speaking even before the speaker ends talking. Overlaps, the second person starts talking right in the moment, right in the instant in which the other speaker stops talking. And so there are lots of interruptions and overlaps. Then let's look at what happens from the uh, adjacency pairs point of view. Remember that adjacency pairs are typical patterns that are followed in conversation. A question, have an answer. Um, praising, there's somebody who says thank you. Um, but what happens here is that these adjacency pairs are not respected. Or at least they are given a dispreferred response. Um, if you remember at line 24, mom offers some banana bread, but the daughter rejects it. Okay? The mother says, have some banana bread, and then the daughter does not accept, willingly accept. She says, look, I'm not that much of a banana bread eater. And I wish you'd stop bothering. Okay, totally different from what we would expect from an adjacency pair. So it's not acceptance, it's rejection. Okay, give me a second, let me... What happens at the level of insertion of sequences? Remember that um, we said that there is usually a pattern to respect in communication, right? Um, if I remember correctly, uh, one of the examples that I gave you to understand sequence is, uh, do you want to come with me? Uh, do you want to go to the movies? And the person says yes. But I can also add some insert insertion sequences. Saying, for instance, a pre using a pre-sequence by saying, um, Hey, have you heard about that new movie? Um, I don't know. The new Avengers movie, whatever. And then the person says yes. And then would you like to come with me? to watch it? Do you want to come with me to the movies to watch it together? Or I can add some, um, I can insert some sequences within my question. Okay, and this, that is what happens here. Okay, 
These women are playing scramble, and there are several insertions within their acts of communication that would normally happen for when you're playing scrabble. There's that section, long section, from lines 15 to 32 that are all about banana bread. Okay, mother cooking the banana bread and uh, the young woman who doesn't like it, um, who doesn't want to be um, bothered any further on the topic because she doesn't like banana bread. And then there's a longer insertion about third person, Linda and her family. The thing is that even if we haven't analyzed, if we haven't read the whole dialogue, what is easy to understand is that we don't understand where the dialogue starts, the main dialogue starts, and what are the insertions. It could be that actually what seems to be the insertions are the main part of the text. Okay. And that's why you have to consider context when you're doing this force analysis, when you're analyzing a text, because there is no such a thing as a dialogue that can be analyzed um, out of context, out of the real, the real world. And more importantly, what you have understood so far is that this, there are lots of information that do not allow an outsider to understand what is being said within the text. Okay? They start talking about Linda and we don't know who Linda is and what is going on in her life. Okay. okay. Now, last text that we're going to, third and last text that we're going to analyze for today is about the relationship between cooperation and relevance. And the text that we're going to analyze is called, is named Visiting Louise. So let's start from the text first. Oh, your mom and dad er, popped, round, popped round last night to see Louise. Guess what time they went round? Um, about nine, ten o'clock? Quarter past eight. She was in bed. She normally goes to bed about half past seven. They said, that's the earliest they could get there. I said, that's a lo load of rubbish. I said... Because they have fish and chips on Friday night. Yeah, so she didn't have to cook. Okay, read that part silently in a second. And then Melvin. Ah, uh, they would have had to wash up the plates and the knives and the forks. But she's just one of those women who don't like leaving stuff around. You know what I mean? Once they've had something, they've got to do it before they go. Can you believe? She's a right pain in the arse sometimes, me mum. That's why they don't go anywhere, you see? Yeah. That's why they don't come out and visit his brother very often. So why did they want to see Louise? It was her birthday. Okay, read this part. Oh, yeah, they should have gone as soon as they got out of work. Yeah, and they could have got fish and chips on the way home, couldn't they? Yeah. So 
So what can we can we can get from this text is that definitely Lisa and Melvin know each other very well. And if you know somebody very well, you can float maxims. Because you know, remember that when we talked about the difference between floating a maxim and violating a maxim. Floating a maxim means that you know as a speaker that the hearer will understand what you're saying and what you mean. Actually, not in what you're saying, what you mean. Um, so if they know each other very well, they can float the maxims. And this is what happens when, at line four and five, when Lisa says that Melvin's mom arrived at Lisa's house at a quarter past eight. Okay, this is what they say. She was in bed. She normally goes to bed about half past seven. They said that's the earliest they could get there. So they say there's lots of things that are implied, that are implicit, and that are not said in these sentences. That's the earliest they could get there. She's normally at bed at that time. And we don't know why she goes to bed at that time. And especially why they didn't warn uh, this person that they were going to their house. Look at what happens at lines six and seven. They said it's the earliest they could get there. I said that's a load of rubbish because they have fish and chips on Friday night. Okay. So there's whatever is implied there in that having fish on Friday night is something that she doesn't even need to explain to Melvin. And we don't know why it's a load of rubbish, at least as outsiders. And she uses some metaphors, if we want to call them that <laughs> as such, with lines 13 and 15 when they float the maximum quality saying she's a pain in the arse. We know that we shouldn't take that literally and that it means something else. Okay, so that was the third and last text that we're going to analyze for today. Uh, so, what did we do for today? We looked at this part B3.1 about using speech acts, and that explained the difference between uh, locutionary act, the mere utterance, um, illocutionary force, so what is the social purpose of what I'm saying, and perlocutionary effect, the effect that this thing, that this utterance has on people. And I gave you the example of it's hot in here. If you can come up with other examples, perfect, fine, even better, because I'm tired of hearing the same example over and over again. So if you have any, if you have any uh, other examples, perhaps you can write them in the comment box, um, right, for this, um, for this course, for this class, sorry. Um, and so we analyzed this text uh, undercover about that and the several speech acts that are used in it. Uh, then for the second text, we looked at um, the pragmatics of conversation and how um, uh, there's this interaction between mom and daughter and uh, how... We looked at uh, adjacency pairs in the case that they are not respected here, the interruptions and overlaps of turn-taking that are part of natural conversation in everyday life, especially when P2 people know each other very well, and um, insertion sequence that, sequences that were so many that we couldn't understand what was the real text and what were insertions. Um, finally, last text about visiting Louise. We looked at the floating of maxims that can often happen, can often occur, when two people know each other very well. Okay, now, um, the video that I want you to watch for today is, uh, again, about floating maxims, and um, it's a very short video, uh, five minutes, actually.
about um, the Big Bang, Big, Bang, Big Bang Theory TV series and how they float maxims. So I hope you enjoy that and um, you can pause the video now and watch that uh, for five minutes and then we'll be back with our song for today. So once you're done with that, as you can see from here, the song for today is Man in the Mirror, and I'll read the lyrics right now. I'm going to make a change for once in my life. Going to feel real good. Going to make a difference. Going to make it right. As I turn up the collar on my favorite winter coat, the wind is blowing my mind. See the kids in the streets, not with not enough to eat. Who am I to be blind, pretending not to see their needs? A summer disregard, a broken bottle top, and one man's soul. They follow each other on the wind, you know? Because they got nowhere to go. That's why I want you to know. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways. And no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make a change. I've been a victim of a selfish kind of love. It's time that I realize there are some with no home. Not a nickel to loan. Could it be really pretend, me pretending that, I'm not, that they're not alone? A willow deep scarred deeply scarred, somebody's broken heart, and a washed out dream. They follow the pattern of the wind, you see, because they got no place to be. That's why I'm starting with me. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways, and no message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. Okay, it repeats. Um, if you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make the change. You got to get it right while you got the time. Because when you close your heart, then you close your mind. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to feel real good. Uh, Shaman. Um, or come on, uh, just lift, lift yourself, you know. You've got to stop it yourself. I got to make the change today. Uh, you got to, you got to, you got to not pick yourself, brother. You know, I've got, I've got, I've got to get that man, that man. Uh, you got to move. Shimon, Shimon. Um, make the change. And then it repeats. Okay, sorry, I, I just wanted to get more information about this shaman because I, I, I had read it, but I that was too much time ago. Um, okay, so this shaman that, um, that he uses in his song um, was an expression originally used by singer Mavis Staples in her 1975 song, I'll Take You There. Just like Michael based some of his early dance steps on James Brown in order to honor him, he used the word shaman to honor Mrs. Staples. Miss Staples. Okay, so it's a quote, let's say, or an homage. Okay, so this was the class for Monday the 6th. Uh, we'll be back on the 8th of April, and it will be our last class before uh, Easter. Um, if you have any questions, just put them in the comment box or send me an email, and I'll be glad to reply. Um, thank you, and have a nice day. Bye.